welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Up In Your Gardening Game, uh, Gardening Showcase and Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is going to be an exciting virtual session. We have with us esteemed gardening expert, Jessica Zander, who comes, with, comes to us with a wealth of experience and knowledge in the world of gardening. Jessica has been gardening for almost 30 years and her garden has been on two garden tours in her hometown of Winchester, Massachusetts. She founded her company, You Can Do It Gardening, that helps people feel less intimidated and discover the joys and the pleasures of gardening. She tells it like it is, and she will definitely let you know if your plants are too close to your house. <laughs> Jessica's no-nonsense approach, coupled with decades-long experience, makes her insights accessible, practical, useful, and fun. Today, Jessica is going to share gardening tips and insights, and she's also going to review short video entries and pictures of our Senior Planet participants showcasing their gardens and will be answering their questions. I am thrilled to introduce you all to Jessica Zander. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Just getting the screen ready. I'm so glad you were able to join us. I'm so excited. I have so much information to share, so I'm going to jump right in and let's go. Uh, so uh, like Nicole said, and thank you so much for your intro, I've been gardening for a very long time. Um, and I just started this business last March um, in response to what I what I determined was a need. Um, and then I quit my day job in June because there was indeed so much need. Um, and so I've been having a blast. Uh, this is my garden, um, actually just a few years ago. And so you get a sense of kind of my style and where I'm coming from. This is the, the sidewalk over here. And I call this the hell strip. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. Uh, this was the same location right around here uh, in 2010 when we bought the house. And so I think, you know, what I like to tell people is it's a long game with gardening. You don't just do it and then you're, you know, you're done. Um, of course, you could have something installed by landscapers and have it be low maintenance and maintained by them. But if you're a gardener or you're an aspiring gardener and you want to learn and enjoy the process, it can take a while. Okay, so I think um, in order to first, you know, whether you're starting off your journey or whether you are, uh, you know, a seasoned gardener, I think it's always good to ask yourself, what do you like? You know, if you have something in your yard, and I see this all the time, you know, let's say you don't like orange and you've got orange daylilies in your yard, you know, let's think about not having those. Uh, let's think about, you know, getting things in there that we really love. And um, so that could be specific colors, that could be plants that you really like um, or don't like and want to get rid of. And it also could be styles. Um, and there are a lot of different types of styles. Um, but regardless of what the style is, whether it's sort of formal or it's informal cottagey garden, you know, whether you have a lot of um, straight lines and clipped hedges, whatever it is, um, I think it's really important to uh, prioritize what you what you see and what you do, because there's a lot of maintenance involved, depending on what you have. And you might look at the same spot over and over and over as you're driving in your driveway, as you're looking out the window. Um, and so, you know, you can't do everything, right? So it's like, what do I, what is most important to me? How do I want to prioritize that? And then do that. So this was my, one of the areas in my backyard in 2012, um, we uh, had a, uh, we had a project that we were doing and then we ended up having this area uh, in the front, we had this area hydro seeded, um, and this was right out the kitchen window. So this is 2012, um, and this is this was it last fall. So around this time, but maybe two weeks now, like uh, in two weeks. Um, so you know, this is a big transformation. This is again illustrating the point of how long it can take, and how things look different in different seasons. So you know, here here I am in. Oops, excuse me, here I am in, in at the kitchen sink where I probably look out the window like 250 times a day. Um, and so on the left, there's summer. In the middle, we have the fall, uh, pretty much like what you just saw. And then on the right is winter. And people don't often think about winter as a gardening season, but actually it's really important. First of all, it's a time of rest. Uh, so plants go dormant. And to a certain extent, 
you know, we do too, or we can, at least in the garden. Um, it's a time to regroup, uh, to learn, to look, you know, you look at your own yard, you say, gosh, what do I see out there? Do I like it? Do I want to do something different? You're looking at trees. You're saying, wow, there's a lot of broken branches there, or I don't like the structure of those. Let me think about what I'm going to be pruning come spring. Um, gosh, I have a lot of structure over here on the right, but not much on the left. Um, I planted this tree because I kind of felt that way. This is going to get about 20 feet tall. So this will fill this area here. Um, so it's it's sort of like in the absence of um, a lot of things that you can see the roadmap forward of, of what you might want to do next. Colors are really essential. So um, you know, uh, I have colors that I prefer. I love pinks and purples, but I also love yellows in there. I have the occasional sprinkle of red. Um, this goes with the fire hydrant. I kind of like that vibe. Um, I also love, you know, colors that you um, can combine together in bouquets. Um, I love that. But there's no rules. If you want a, a garden full of yellows, do it. If you want no color at all, but just greens and the subtlety of that, do that. There's no rules. And so I'm not going to throw a color wheel at you and say, you need to focus on complementary colors and these ones clash. No, it's whatever you like. And you have to kind of honor that and that gut and don't worry about um, what you may perceive to be rules. And I think that's a theme in general with everything that I promote, which is you have to be true to yourself and what you like and not worry about um, you know the, the conventions. Uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So I know everybody knows this, but I often ask people when I teach a class, what, which one is the shade garden? And a lot of people immediately know it's the one on the right because it's the hostas. Um, but, you know, a lot of people lament having shade. You know, it's, oh man, I have so much shade. I don't know what to do with it. You know, it's, I don't know what plants and it's no fun and this and that. And I love shade gardens because there's subtlety there because you can really see the contrast in foliage which kind of operates as its own um you know color palette there are plenty of plants that bloom in the shade these are stilbes this is lamium which is a ground cover hostas bloom and there's uh, plenty of other things as well like hookera or coral bells hellebores you know things like this and uh so i i think it's great to have roses and Catmin and zinnias and everything, but also shade is good. And the key thing here is to be realistic. So if you live in a place where you have a lot of shade, don't try to plant roses, you'll be disappointed. Similarly, if you have blazing hot sun, you know, on the front of your, in the front of your yard or in the back or wherever it is, don't put hostas there because, or mountain laurels or, you know, things like that, because they're not going to be living their best lives. They may survive, but they're going to struggle and they're not going to give you their, the best version of themselves. So shape is another uh, thing that I think is really important. This is a client, um, who I, I love the idea of curves. I mean, look at this, right? A lot of curves going on. Curves are natural. There's no straight lines in nature. Um, so it's. I think it's great to have curves. The challenge here is, or the issue that I saw was there's too many. It's too sharp. It's hard to mow. So that's impractical. And also it's very choppy. You know, it's like you look at this and go, oh gosh, let's lots of stuff going on. So I advised a more gentle curve. So sort of like, you know, swooping around like, Oops, swooping around like this and coming in. I hope you can see my cursor and coming around like that. Good. Thank you, Nicole. Um, something like that. Um, and even this, you can't see from the depth necessarily how wide or swooping those curves are. But I said, maybe even a little bit less tight like that. Um, and maybe a little bit chopping off here. Because you want the curves also to be proportional to the size of the area that you have. So a big swooping curve in a large space works really well. Um, just don't have a, like choppy angled um, areas or curves because A, again, like I said, it's hard to mow and um, B, it's like the eye doesn't rest uh, comfortably or easily on a choppy uh, shape like that. So here's another example. This was with a client in Tennessee. Actually, this was a virtual appointment. So, you know, he's got the classic, you know, boxy uh, 
backyard. A lot of us have that. And he had the perimeter stones like this, right? So, you know, I thought, well, let's just play around with a little bit here. Let's come out from the edges. Let's, you know, make it a little more interesting. And what he did was he really did it up. He did, oop, excuse me. He, there we go. Look at that. Um, so it's got this beautiful curve, gracious curve here. Something went in the corner where there wasn't anything. So I suggested, how about the magnolia you have in the front, which is too close to the house? Put that in the back, have something of substance in the corner that you, it's a focal point. Don't have a, like a little thing here because it's a lot of wasted space, but this magnolia will grow up nice and tall. Meanwhile, he eliminated the sort of the path to nowhere right here. You know what I mean? And had and closed it off and had plenty of space for everything in there. So that's an example of, you know, this was free, by the way, right? Like he moved the, his own stones around that he had for his border. He bought some mulch. He moved a little bit, you know, a couple things around. That's a very inexpensive way to have a little bit of a makeover, which is just to tighten up your your edge, whether you have stone or whether you're, you know, edging with an edging tool or a shovel, I just use a shovel and then toss some mulch on there. That's the most inexpensive little glow up that you can do. And I found that it's very effective. So placement is essential. I obsess about this topic. So we've got um, on the left, we've got a situation that is easily remedied. On the right, not so much. So the reason I say this is easily remedied, and you might have seen this countless times in front of homes with massively overgrown rhododendrons, yews, other shrubs. A lot of times what people do is they, at great expense or significant expense, they have sh overgrown shrubs removed. Then they buy all new shrubs and put those in. That can cost hundreds of dollars to do that where these plants are very well established and perfectly healthy and can survive very happily with a major haircut. All you do here is you'd prune back, here are the windows, right? No one, can, no one can see out the window. Assuming they don't want the privacy, right? Assuming they wanna be able to look out, you would just simply prune like this. And in fact, you can prune lower, which buys you some time and you don't have to be pruning again next year because these things can grow quite a bit in a given year. So you can actually bring it down just like that or just even lower. If it's unhealthy, you can bring it literally down to like eight inches off the ground. I've heard people say, I tried to kill it because I didn't want it anymore and it kept sprouting <laughs> new shoots. So they're incredibly, plants are incredibly difficult actually to kill. I've heard about, you know, countless examples. It's when you want to kill it that you can't and people fear the most is killing their plant. That's what people are afraid of the most in my experience. And I'm here to tell you, it's extremely difficult to kill a plant by pruning. Um, sometimes plants just die on their own. And also a lot of times plants die because they're not watered sufficiently after planting. You know, they need water to get established. So don't worry about pruning and think you're gonna, you know, hurt your plant. Just make sure you make clean cuts, no ripping, no tears and you'll be fine. Um, this situation, not great, because this is a, gonna be a huge tree. It's already very big. It's creeping up to the third floor here. This is an umbrella pine. This is just bad placement. You should not be planting a tree right next to a house and really anything right next to a foundation. You want at least one foot of clearance between a plant and the house at its full size. So if you plant something, and it's and the edge of the plant is a foot away from your foundation, that's not going to work because it's going to grow. You know, these kittens turn into cats. So you've got to think ahead, read the tags. They're usually right, although sometimes they're a little off. And just be very disciplined about where things go, even though it'll look maybe weird. It might even look uncomfortable, it might feel uncomfortable to you because it looks so empty or, you know, like there's nothing there. In that case, what you do is you fill in with perennials around. So perennials are the plants that come back every year. So here's a smart person here. They had a hole, something, a plant died perhaps. And so they put this small thing in here, surrounded by all these mature plants. Eventually this will grow to be approximately the same size. 
what you do here is you either put in perennials that you can move later without too much trouble, much easier to move a perennial um, like, you know, lilies or hostas or what have you. I'm saying that because those are ones that people know um, that they're very familiar with or put in annuals, put in some begonias, put in some, you know, impatience, something like that, or just put mulch um, or some other kind of weed uh, deterrent. Don't do landscape fabric if you can possibly avoid it. Um, and I, if I have time, I'll explain why. Um, so that's what I would do there. You've got to just have the discipline. So one of my favorite things, and I alluded to it a little like a few minutes ago, is pruning because I just like to show people how to do it and liberate them so that they can feel comfortable doing it in their own yards. Um, and it's not that hard. Uh, in fact, you you don't even need that many complicated tools. I use this pretty much every day. These are loppers and these are hand pruners. I don't even use, these are hand shears, um, but also a lot of people use electric hedge trimmers. I don't have to, ha I don't happen to have those, um, but I like the feel of being connected to the plant. I like to see exactly what I'm doing. Uh, electric hedge trimmers can damage branches, but having said that, sometimes it has to be done because the volume of, of plants that you're trying to prune um, kind of calls for it. But um, I like to actually, you know, be hands on with each of the the plants that I'm that I'm working with and actually, see, you know, seeing what I'm doing. Um, so everyone always wants to know when the best time is. And I, I, like I said before, it's very difficult to kill plants. So I think basically it's, you know, the best time is when you have the time um, and when you can deal with the, the carnage, I like to call it the plant carnage. Um, and, you know, anytime you can prune dead or damaged branches, um, generally, you know, the the common wisdom, and I, I'm not disagreeing with it, is the best time may actually be as plants are coming out of dormancy and, you know, out of winter into spring. That's usually the best time with exceptions, um, you know, things that are about to bloom, like spring comes around and don't touch the lilacs or the azaleas or the rhododendrons, you know, wait until after they bloom so that you enjoy that. If you can't, then just do it. Like if you need to prune your azaleas in November, middle of November, which I know some people would be horrified to hear me suggest, do it. I did it last year with clients. It, by the time spring rolled around, they were gorgeous and starting to bush out. You know what I mean? Then a few months later, they're even more amazing. You won't get blooms on those things. Okay. You might be foregoing a cycle, but if you need to prune, you need to prune and go ahead and do it. Don't, don't be afraid. Um, so, you know, there are different styles and I think it's, I think pruning is quite a personal thing, actually. Um, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it and just don't overthink, but this is a natural treatment to a forsythia. You, this plant may look familiar. This is, I believe this is a type of a hemlock tree. Look at the trunk structure in this thing. The way they've pruned it, you can actually see the beauty of that plant. Um, these back to the electric hedge trimmers. I think this is very difficult to do well. I don't want to try to do that because it will take a lot of time and expertise, but some people really enjoy that look. And I, I don't have any issue with that. I think you just have to know kind of what you're going for. This is an overgrown type of rhododendron, and this is the sidewalk. So someone's had to do this so people can get by. The challenge is, is that it's wonky looking. You know, it's just, it's very lopsided. What I would do here is I would actually cut all, see the shape here? I would actually do this and bring it back down because even though it looks like it's a healthy distance away from the sidewalk, it's about four feet. Um, it's actually too too big for, the, for that area and it's not proportional. And then moreover, it's got this issue here. So, you know, you do this thing called, you know, uh, rejuvenation pruning if it's unhappy or just pruning way back to control size. And then the plant responds and takes off and then you're, you're back where you were. And then 10 years later, you've got to do it again. <laughs> so no big deal. Again, don't have any fear. It's, it's all going to be fine. So, you know, here we are, it's fall. Um, and you can do a lot in the fall. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of the, the, the growing season. Um, you know, some people may be ready. I, I think I'm ready to have to go into dormancy, but you can still do a lot. So um, last year on November 30th, 
I was outside in my yard creating a whole new garden bed, a whole new one, November 30th. You can literally plant any time unless the ground is frozen. So there, there were these conventions that said only spring and fall. And the problem there is that, first of all, it can be very hot in uh, in April. There was, a, I think, a 90 degree day in April here. It can be very cool and rainy in July. Um, and again, it can be very hot again in, in November, or excuse me, uh, September, October. So I think what you have to think about is being pragmatic. Um, and do I want to divide something in July, even though it's 90 degrees, which I've done many times? Yes, as long as I'm willing to water to help it get established. You know, so you just have to work with the conditions you have. Yeah, it may be easier to get established in the fall. Um, the ground is cooling. You don't have, maybe it's raining. You don't have to water as much just because it is under less stress. It does not mean you can't do it at other times. And just because it may be cool in April when you do it, it doesn't mean that right at the next day, it's not going to be 90 degrees and you have to water like crazy. So I think, you know, you just want to take a very pragmatic approach. Um, you know, so at this time of year, people are thinking about yard cleanup. And I think more and more people are uh, thinking along the lines of, um, you know, what's best for our environment, our immediate environment and ecology and the wildlife that it supports. And so it used to be, you know, let's get everything tidied up, make it look neat and clean, do the fall cleanup. And so everything's ready for the spring. Now, more and more people are talking about, hey, wait a minute, let's just wait. Let's wait until spring to do the cleanup. Let's leave the leaves. Let's leave the perennials that have kind of died back um, as much as possible. Why? Because this provides habitat over the winter for insects that actually do over winter, which means they, you know, kind of stick around for the winter, um, for birds to kind of go in there and other wildlife to seek refuge. Um, if it drives you crazy and you see a lot of like very overgrown, droopy uh, things that are all over the place, sure. You know, I go in and I do a little bit of tidying of some things. I want to make sure the sidewalk is clear and people can get by and so on. Um, but I leave the rest. So this is in addition to being good for, you know, the environment or the ecology, the local ecology, it's also nice to be a little lazy in the fall. So I encourage that. Um, what I do think people should be doing in the fall, however, in addition to dividing and planting and so on, is weeding. You know, weeding is still a thing. And um, more importantly, still is scanning for invasives. So um, invasive plants are a huge issue uh, it, with all the clients that I have seen, which is many, it's several hundred now. Um, I There's almost no properties that I visit that uh, don't have invasive weeds on the premises. This ranges from a nuisance, um, like lesser calendine or creeping bell flower, to like full on destructive bittersweet and Japanese knotweed, which, you know, I don't know what the number is for, for the economic and the uh, financial, uh, you know, impact of these horrible things, but rest assured, uh, you don't want them in your yard. So you want to get them early um, and you want to try to prevent them from taking over. Bittersweet will wrap itself around plants and trees and kill them. Japanese knotweed will just encroach and take over your whole yard. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I mean, I'm being be just cautionary tale over here. In England, it, it's so severe that banks won't finance loans to people who are buying property where knotweed has been detected. It's just too much of a liability. Um, so it's, you know, it's no joke, this invasive weed stuff. Um, and it's becoming, you know, more and more of an issue. Um, so that's what I think about that in terms of fall. And then just, you know, relax. Um, the other thing to do, and I haven't done this actually yet, is order bulbs uh, to plant. And again, you're not too late doing this if you haven't done it. So last year I was out there on Thanksgiving. Uh, you don't want to put bulbs in too early, tulips in particular, because you don't want them to rot. Um, other bulbs you can put in. 
like uh, daffodils and so on, but I just put them all in at once um, in late November. So you have a lot of time if you haven't done that yet. And if your nurseries are still open where you, wherever you are um, and have things in them, I know some nurseries are already closed or are closing and running out of stuff. Before you buy new stuff, um, you have to pay attention to the light conditions, like I was saying before. Um, and look at your own yard as a nursery. You know, so I, I move things around all the time. Right now, what's in bloom for me is hardy mums, the perennial kind that come back again and again, Montauk daisies. Um, I've got some, uh, you know, uh, Russian sage that's still lingering. I've got, you know, grasses, um, you name it, catmint. These are all things that are still kind of puttering along in my yard. And I've spread them all over the property. Um, and so that's free. And it's also a way to create continuity in your own yard. So you have something over here, over there, over there. It looks cohesive. The other thing it does is it helps with um, succession planning. So if you do that with a number of different plants, you have the succession of blooms that everybody strives for. You know, let's have something April through November that's in bloom. That's how, that's what I've found is helpful to do is to do it like that, is to divide things that you have. Um, so, you know, for, for, the, for your own sake, also, before you buy new stuff, make sure that the stuff you already have isn't too close, uh, like I was saying before. If you have shrubs that you recently put in and then you realize after this call, oh, gosh, let me take a look at that boxwood. I might have put that in a little close to the house or I might have put that in a little too close to the rhododendron. Dig it out. Just move it somewhere else. Definitely don't buy a new one if it's too close. OK. So looking ahead to spring. Um, you know, I mentioned that spring is a really great time to prune. Again, you can prune now if you still want. And think about wreaths, okay? All the evergreens and the wreaths. It's not like people are pruning these things in March and hanging on to them for months. <laughs> like the plants will be just fine. Um, but so thinking ahead, if you don't want to do anything still this fall, um, you know, you'll go in and, and cut back the perennials that you didn't before. Even if you want to experiment and keep a little area that you don't prune back, I get it that it's habits are hard to break. So if you still want to do your fall cleanup or if it's already happened, maybe there's a little area that you're that you could consider leaving aside and seeing what that's like. Um, it gives you also something to look at over the winter. Um, and then you wait for 50 degrees five days in a row. And that helps the beneficial insects. So these are the ones we want. These are the ladybugs, the praying mantis, the honeybees, things like that. Um, by that time, they've laid their eggs and they've gotten all out of there. Um, so you clean up the sticks and excess leaves and things. You edge your beds and you can add compost to enrich the soil, which I recommend to everybody. It's not the same as fertilizer. It's your soil needs nutrients or your plants need nutrients. And if you don't have um, nutrient rich soil, then I advise compost. And then mulch is important too on top of the compost because that adds, um, you know, it's good for, for uh, moisture retention and for uh, weed prevention. So that's important and non-dyed mulch. You don't want any dyes and those are toxins. And a lot of times it's like, why are they dying things? What What is in there? Is there particle board in there or pallets? And that's, that's, a, that's what happens sometimes with the dyed mulch. Not always, but sometimes. So these are the things that I just blew through really quickly. <laughs> I hope you were able to hang in there with me. Um, you know, again, I just want to emphasize the view um, the colors that you like, you know, the view as in priority, prioritizing, um, going for the colors you don't, removing the colors that you don't uh, like, uh, being realistic about the light, uh, thinking really hard about the shape of the beds, and then the placement of the plants that you have in there. And then I talked about the invasive um, weeds. I, these are the, this is the list of ones that I think are particularly um, you know, bad in my area. I think they vary from, from region to region. I know kudzu is a huge problem in the South, if anyone 
um, on the call is from the South. You'll know what I'm talking about. Um, native plants are always good. They are, first of all, they're um, because they're native to your area, they're going to be uh, less to take care of, more easily established, better for the local ecology, and um, may or may not be pollinators, but pollinators are another type of, you know, thing we can all put in our garden to promote uh, various different things, including monarchs. Um, so that would be milkweed is the only plant that is a full cycle plant for the monarchs. So there are other plants that are good for monarchs to eat, but not the caterpillars. It's the milkweed that we want. Um, I mentioned the succession planning and how to kind of start thinking about that if you're not already. And then if you want to learn more, um, so I'm on all the social media platforms that you can do it gardening, but also you take a walk in your neighborhood, see what, what's going on um, in gardens there. Um, take out books from the library or, you know, buy new or use bookstores, whatever. I have like 70 books I like to pour over, particularly in the winter. Um, there is, um, there are a lot of plant ID apps that you can download. I use picture this and it's a free version. Um, and so every time I see a plant that I don't recognize, I ID it. I want to know what it is. And then my own catalog and my brain expands when I see something I really like, I note it, you know, maybe I want that. Maybe, maybe I want to um, add that to a certain area. These are the four YouTube channels that I um, want to promote. They are fantastic, each for different reasons. Please feel free, again, to take a picture of the screen. Um, they are informative. Um, they're all in different areas. So this one here is in um, Oregon. This guy's in Canada. This guy's in Maryland. And she's in New Jersey. Um, so kind of a, a smattering of regions, nothing in the Southwest, I'm afraid, if you're if you're from there. So we're on to the questions. Um, so this is a tricky situation, and I hear about this so often from people. What do you do about deer? I also hear about what do we do about bunnies, but that's a different that's a different class. Um, so uh, this person is struggles with deer. And I just want to say that um, there's no one who can tell you definitively, here are the solutions, here are the products, here are the plants. Um, deer, when, they, uh, when they're on their little corridors or their paths that they do, or they're really, really hungry, they're going to eat whatever they want. There's no plant, I don't think really, except for a few that are safe from the deer. Um, and so you have to be realistic. However, there are plants that they don't generally like, and there are products um, that you can try. So I put this together here. So my strategy that I advise is look in your own yard uh, um, to see what they're not eating. Um, so is there anything? <laughs> Maybe there isn't anything. Maybe they're just eating everything. But if they're not eating um, some things, do more of those things. Just have more of those plants. Um, I also like to suggest that people ask their neighbors. Uh, so again, if you're on a very specific path or corridor for deer, it could be a house next door that is immune from the deer, but it could be that that also the deer visit their yards. What do they have? What are the, what are the deer not eating? Let's try it in your yard. Whatever you do, don't buy too many of a new thing because you could be wasting your money. Um, so typically, though, they don't like smelly, uh, toxic or fuzzy things, and they don't like most bulbs. So that should give you, um, you know, a few different categories of things. So in your region, look up what those types of plants are. And here are some that I think, you know, are very common and hopefully uh, are available to you in wherever you are. So catmint, liriope, Russian sage, grasses, yarrow, you know, you, you see the list. Um, and, you know, try that and hopefully you'll, you'll have um, some luck there. For bulbs, not tulips, but snowdrops, crocus, daffodils, and bearded iris um, tend to be good. And then you can try the all natural deterrence. Um, I, I even heard of someone making their own. So I put the, the list of ingredients that she uses. Um, the other tip there was 
rotate around. Uh, don't just use one and think that you're good and don't just adhere to or observe the frequency um, recommendations on the bottle because uh, the deer get used to it. And so you have to be nimble, <laughs> basically. You have to keep, keep it fresh, rotate it around. So here's um, the next question. And thank you, by the way, for submitting these questions. I appreciate it. So um, this kind of gets back with back to this thing of the shade um, and the challenge that some people have. And I, I do love a shade garden. I think this situation's tough because first of all, note the window here, okay? Also, it's a shallow area. Um, so you don't want anything that's gonna get too tall and you don't want anything that's gonna get too wide. So whatever someone does here and I, I notice it's shade. I don't know about how much labor or um, time that, you know, Marilyn has. And Marilyn, if you're on the call, I don't know if you have a lot of time for maintenance. But so I'm just going to suggest a few things. Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of options. So you could do, I would say, dwarf shrubs here. So dwarf is key because of the reasons I said, you don't want them getting too um, wide and you don't want them getting too tall. So my favorite uh, shade shrubs are um, mountain laurel, inkberry, uh, Japanese holly, and then andromeda. The inkberry and the mountain laurel are native to my area of New England. Um, and so I think you just have to, you know, look into what may be native in your area. Spacing is key. So maybe one, two, three is what I would say. The lowest one goes here. You can have a taller one here. I can't quite get the the um, the full sense of the, the space um, from the picture. It could be that a full size and not a dwarf could work here. I don't know if there's a window right here. You know what I mean? You just have to be realistic about what you have, but keeping in mind the space that you have. If you want to fill in with some perennials, um, some shade perennials, then I would try hookera or coral bells, um, a stilby, and hellebores. The, these things bloom at different times. So the hellebores would be first, the um, a, a stilby would be next, and then the coral bells would be last in the season. So that kind of spreads out the blooms, which is nice to have something of interest. If you want to be very low maintenance, I'd put in those three shrubs and then um, either some ground cover or just mulch and just call it a day and be realistic about the time that you have. And then just a quick time check. How are we doing, Nicole? We're doing great. Awesome. Okay. Because now I'm going to go all hydrangea on you. So the hydrangeas are the thing that are, I think, the most confusing for people. Um, I mean, when I say I get questions about this every day, I mean every day and I mean multiple times a day because I get all these questions on the social media platforms from things that I post and people are confused. And it's no wonder that they're confused because there's different, different types of hydrangeas and different ways to treat them. So this kind is a macrophylla hydrangea. And so what that is, is um, something you don't want to touch really at all. Um, this is the kind of thing that, you know, people in New England love, particularly around the Cape or the islands, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, et cetera, warmer climates. They're also very popular in Southern climates. Um, and so the reason you don't want to prune these is because you may be cutting off the buds. Okay. So I'm going to skip to this now. Here's another thing where if you want to take this picture, it summarizes um, everything I think that may be important. I like to think about hydrangeas in two major categories, just because it can be very confusing. One is the category that you don't really do anything to. That's easy. Put your feet up and relax. You don't have to do much maintenance. The second category is um, ones that require a little bit more or benefit from more pruning. Nothing's required, but if you want your plant to live its best life, um, I recommend pruning. So here we go. This is a macrophylla hydrangea right here. This is the one that um, we just had uh, on the other page. This is the kind that blooms on this 
old wood, old growth, meaning in the current year, already now, at least in my region, you start, you're starting to see buds forming. If you cut those off either in the fall or in the spring, this is a spring picture, you are cutting off the blooms for your season now, for next summer. Um, the exception being for uh, hybrids, like this is a hybrid, it's called a serrata. Um, that's nice, that's like a hedge, okay? So it's like, if it's not too cold, because the, the cold will freeze the buds. So in Boston, we had a major freeze um, in February. It was called an Arctic blast. Anyone who didn't cut off their, their stalks in the fall, um, their buds froze. So New England is not a good area or, and nowhere cold is good to have this type of hydrangea, the macrophylla, unless it's something like an endless summer or a serrata or some other kind of hybrid where the flowers actually grow on the new wood coming up from the bottom. So you've got this old stuff that you don't touch just in case the buds are fine for the through the winter. And you've got the stuff coming off the bottom that forms the buds later in the season. That's this, okay? So it's like a hedge. It's ideally you've got flowers from the middle of the summer all the way through into the fall with a hybrid, like an endless summer. Um, but if it's like a winter we just had, you're only going to get them later in the season, if at all. There are a lot of um, a lot of uh, hydrangeas like this that didn't bloom at all because they were not hybrids. And so I recommend that if you have a hydrangea that never blooms, you get rid of it because life is short and you should not have a hydrangea that just sits there and is foliage only unless you have plenty of space and like the foliage. Um, but there are other things too with these, which is that they like acidic soil. They like a lot of moisture. And again, they don't like to be pruned much. Um, and they don't like a lot of sunlight. They do need three to four hours um, a day that can be filtered sunlight, but don't put them somewhere where there's really hot afternoon sun on them. They don't like that either. So they're divas, basically. They're just divas. So beware, Buy, buyer beware on the macrophylla types. Um, the other kind that does not like pruning is an oak leaf, unless it's very overgrown or branches are broken. So, and it's the same with the macrophyllas. Like if branches are dead, pull the, you can actually pull them out. Um, but if they're otherwise fine, you don't really need to touch them at all. So oak leaf looks like this, tiny, tiny, and then it becomes this. And this is one that is happy in not full shade, but filtered sunlight, um, very beautiful shade plant in my experience, and I love them. And they're also happy in a lot of sun, so they're pretty versatile. Climbing hydrangeas, I would typically recommend climbing on something like a trellis of some kind. This here, it adheres. It has like these little suckers practically um, that attach themselves to the side of the house. So this client, you know, prunes it back slightly every spring and it's beautiful, but she's on top of it. These things can grow like crazy once they're established. And then we've got um, panicle types or PG. This particular one is a limelight. This is at my house. I showed you a picture early on of the, um, the you know, the prioritization and what it looked like in um, 2012 and then in, in last year. This is after, so this is April 2nd, actually. Um, so I leave it in the winter because it's nice to look at. It's something interesting um, to look at. It's some, the birds hang out in there um, and I like that. However, I go in and do a very hard prune every spring. And I've pruned this thing to go up and out because I want the privacy, um, but you can easily also cut it down to be this height or you could have it be wide I want mine to be narrow just because I have windows here. So I need to be able to walk by. It doesn't look like it, like you can just because the angle, but this was planted four feet from the house. And actually I could have used another foot. So this is another reminder again about spacing. This is what this plant looks like then in August. So a very healthy haircut of this plant results in this. If you don't plant these, excuse me, if you don't um, prune these, they're fine, but they're going to be um, laden down 
right? With the, the, like, if you have snow or a lot of rain, those panicles, those blooms hold a lot of moisture. Um, if there's ice, the branches can crack or with snow. So you want to foster those strong uh, branches to be able to withstand the weight, therefore pruning and really going for or fostering the, the stronger, thicker branches is advisable. Then you clean out all the clutter. Trust me when I say it grows in. This is like two feet of growth each year. So you don't have to worry about hurting this. This withstands a lot of pruning and it's not a big deal. Um, and then finally, there's an arborescence type. So this is like a Annabelle or an Incredible. Um, these can handle heavy pruning also. I do this in the spring. You can go like a, you know, six inches, eight inches off the ground with these. All of the blooms um, come off of the new growth in that current year. Back to that concept of like new wood, old wood. So this is another new wood variety um, or new growth. All right. Now we're on to Q&A if anyone has questions. Nicole, how do we do it? How are we doing on time? Are we good? We are doing great with time, awesome. and yeah. we actually have a few questions uh, that Excellent. will popped into the chat. And okay. before I go into those, if you have a question that you like answered, you can go ahead and post it in the chat. You can also uh, use the reactions uh, um, button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. Um, so I'll go ahead and just read off these questions for you. Uh, the first we have is from Barbara, and she's asking if ferns are invasive. Um, she suddenly has a lot uh, on the north side of her house, in in her foundation garden bed so ferns i think by definition can't be invasive um as if they're native to your area i i mean i i imagine that some ferns may be invasive in certain areas if they're not native to that area um but at least here you know uh they're not so then there's many different types and let me just while i have a second differentiate between invasive and aggressive Invasive is a designation or classification by a state agency. So we can refer to something as invasive, but it, it may not be. It may just be aggressive or undesired. Um, something could be native and completely undesirable, like poison ivy. Uh, you know, I don't want that in my yard, nor do I want Virginia creeper as great as, great as it is for wildlife. It can also wrap itself around and choke and kill plants. So I don't want that. I'm also very allergic to that. So I, I hope that answers the question of ferns. Um, if you do find that you have something that is very aggressive, I would suggest if you can to try to get a handle on it, um, get get you know beat it back into submission. But there are plenty of examples of things that it's just you can't. You know, Pachysandra takes over the whole yard, or ferns take over a whole area, and then it's like you just have to kind of live with it um, and plant other things in in amongst it and see if you can you know break it up a little bit like if you have a lot of ferns or a lot of a ground cover try putting a shrub in the middle of that to create a little bit of height if you don't have that already in a given space great uh our next question is from deb and she wants to know if now is a good time to plant garlic from the clove. Ooh, good question I think it is um, because it's a bulb. I actually don't plant garlic, but every year I think, oh, maybe this is the year. I don't do vegetables really because I used to, but there are so many bunnies in my neighborhood. It just doesn't make any sense at all. But if anyone else wants to drop in the chat recommended timing on uh, garlic bulb planting, please do that. I just want to say also, in case anyone has the delusion that I know everything, I definitely do not. I'm constantly learning every day. And I, I think part of gardening is that, you know, stimulation of grow, of uh, learning all the time. Got it. Okay. Anna wants to know what is succession planting? If you could just go over that again. Absolutely. Yeah. So succession planting is when you plant um, things that bloom in succession. So something is in, it could be in the same little spot or it could be across your whole um, yard where it's something in April, something in, you know, May, something in June. So you always have something in bloom, which is 
very desirable to many gardeners. I know I shoot for that, but I'm still tweaking it all the time. You know, July rolls around and I'll have a little area in my garden and I'll think, oh, there's nothing in bloom there. What else do I have in bloom around my yard that I can divide and put there? Um, and I've never met a perennial I can't divide. And I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying, like, there's no perennial that you can't divide. There are ones that are a little harder, like grasses are super thick. The root ball is really hard to drive your shovel in there, but you can use a knife. I've heard people using saws. Um, and then um, there's other things like I have my favorite shade plant of all time is Aurelia Sun King. And it's this gorgeous um, chartreuse color in the early spring. And it gets about three feet tall and it looks beautiful with my limelight hydrangea, actually, which is behind me, but you can't see it because I've got this background. Um, but anyway, that's really uh, tough. And I don't want to mess it up because I love it so much. But it's you can divide any perennial, including, by the way, the macrophylla hydrangeas, the picture that you see behind my head. Um, you can pry off pieces of those types of hydrangeas and plant them elsewhere. I've done it many, many times. And again, free plant people don't go out and buy the same thing that you have, you know, just divide what you have and move it around. Thanks, Jess. We have another question from Diana, who's asking, what are the best plants for container gardens? I mean, I think it depends where you where you live. You're talking about like pots and stuff like that? I'm not sure if Diana is still on and wants to clarify. Um, feel free to unmute. Um, but that, yeah, that's... I'm going to assume that, yeah. I mean, I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about what you like. You know, I don't know what region you're in, Diana, but um, for me, it's like my favorite annuals would be Persian Shield without question. It's a tall, deep purple, beautiful annual, annual for us where I am. Like I know in Florida, um, it's a perennial down there. So it just depends on your region. It depends on what you like. It depends on the size of the pot. <laughs> you know, um, if you have, if you want to do containers on your patio, you know, if you have limited space, I think you have to go with what you like. So it's just not at all one size fits all, but I would say it's nice to switch it out. If things are getting a little tired, um, mid season, put a couple new things in there, have perennials in your pots too. You know, there's nothing wrong with that or put bulbs in your pots. So there's, there's so many options, so many different ways of, of doing container gardens. Thanks, Jess. And I see Diana posted in the chat. Yes. So you did. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. I'm glad. Um, the next question is from Ginny. She's asking, uh, how do you control Japanese iris from taking over? It's very hard to dig up. Yeah, I mean, I think anything that's hard to dig up, you just have to dig it up. I mean, there's certain things like um, runner, like the running kind of bamboo, where or knotweed. Don't get me started on the knotweed, but where you actually have to think about um, trenching and putting in like metal plates or things to contain those plants. I don't have experience with the iris that you're talking about. I've heard about this. I mean, I've seen you know, countless examples of things that are undesirable to people. And unfortunately, just like weeding, it's like you just have to, these are things we have to deal with, the things that we don't want everywhere and you just have to dig them out. I'm sorry, that's probably not the answer that you're looking for, but it's the pragmatic answer, you know. If anyone else wants to drop a suggestion about the, that particular plant in the chat, please do. And just anything that I'm responding to, if you have a different, you know, something else to share to add to it, just please put it in the chat for other people's benefit. Absolutely. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Um, I have, forgive me if I'm pronouncing your, your name wrong, Addy or Adi um, is saying that they heard Nandinas are not native to Northeast US um, and are therefore bad for the environment and birds. Is this true? Jeez, I don't know. I don't know. This is a good example of I have no idea. But I think it is. So if someone knows the answer, please drop it in the chat. Um, I think this is an example of a possible invasive versus aggressive question. Um, 
there are, if you use picture this, for example, they have a map. So you, you take a picture of a plant, it scans it, and then it, if it identifies it correctly, which in my experience, it generally does, you, you scroll down and there's a map and it shows you whether it's native in your area or it's exotic or it's cultivated um, or, you know, it's invasive. So it gives you all the, each one has a color. Um, so I think it's okay to have something that's cultivated or exotic, in my opinion, because we're not going to all have all native gardens. Um, but if we have invasive things, we shouldn't, we should not, you know, we should try to get rid of them if possible. Um, and if you have something that is rapidly spreading, like um, I've got a bunch of rows of Sharon in my yard, I've probably got about 12. I know that those are invasive in four states, um, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and one other. Um, there are different types too. You can have a more sterile type or whatever. I, I understand why they're invasive because they drop their seeds everywhere and then there's sprouts everywhere. So am I going to get rid of my Rose of Sharon? No, I'm not, at least not right now. If I have a burning bush, those travel, which I do, I have two. Okay. So those are invasive in most, in most parts of the country. Um, but, and I'm going to get rid of mine. I have to find the right moment, but I'm planning to get rid of them. Anything that travels, um, you know, by seed, basically birds eating the seeds and then flying off and distributing them. That's tough because if we have these things and we know they're invasive, then we are actually impacting the environment around us. Um, I'm not sure that exactly answers the question, but since I'm obsessed with invasives right now, I'm just going to like work it in wherever I can, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, that works for us, Jess. <laughs> okay. Great. Um. So, next question is from Arlene, and she's asking: Have you heard of wild morning glory that wraps around other plants or fences, etc.? Yeah, bindweed. I, I'm sure other people are familiar with it. It's horrible. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, like with any invasive you just have to be on top of it you just have to yank and yank and yank and that's just it sucks the life force out of the gardeners you know that like yes we all have to weed but when things are like profoundly annoying slash invasive it isn't fun it's not fun um it does it does you know like i said just sort of suck the joy out of the room um and then it's like, all right, let's try to focus on the positive things that we that we like. But I just want to acknowledge, like it it's extremely stressful for some people to be battling weeds and particularly invasive ones. It's not fun. It's hard work. Um, and hopefully there's a balance of fun things that that you all have that keep you going and stimulated in your in your gardens. Thanks, Jess. Got a few more questions here. They're just, they're just piling in. <laughs> yeah, go um, for it. I'm here. I'm here for it. <laughs> Joan asks, when and how often should I fertilize my plants? Well, it depends on the plants, you know? I mean, I, I will say that um, I don't fertilize my plants. Um, on occasion, I'll fertilize those pesky macrophylla hydrangeas because I know that they like acidic soil and I want to try to get the blooms out of them. Although I'm like a fool because it's so cold here that it's like they don't care, but generally I don't. And the reason is because um, we just put compost everywhere. Um, and this is something I feel really passionate about. If you think about the forest floor uh, where, you know, leaves fall, debris, branches, everything just stays right there. No one's running around with yard waste bags cleaning up out there in the woods. So everything decomposes, goes back into the soil. Those nutrients are rich. And therefore, um, you know, it's completely unlike most of our suburban or urban or even rural um, gardens where people take the things off site, either in bags or they rake them over to a, the side or whatever. Um, so if you can do what I like to call and a lot of other people call chop and drop, which is when you are doing your perennial cutbacks in the spring or any time you're deadheading or in, in the midsummer, if you have catmint, if you know what I'm talking about, that, that very fluffy uh, purple plant that I showed at the very beginning along the sidewalk, 
you can cut those back mid season and they will bloom again for you. What I do at that point is I prune the, that off basically all the way down. Okay. And then I tuck those little clippings around the, the edges of um, like around the base of the plant, that thing then grows up again and covers all of those um, dead bits. All right. Those nutrients are going back into the ground. So that's what I try to do as much as possible. Um, the other thing you can do is leave your leaves, put your grass clippings on there. These are all nutrients that are going into the soil or back into the soil. Um, every other year we put compost all over our, our beds. And when I say we put compost, let me just put this in perspective. So we've got um, half an acre and we usually get about um, four to five yards of compost. A yard is about 25 bags. So our soil is amazing, um, but we work for it. And there, but we don't have to fertilize because we have really rich soil. Um, so I always recommend that people put compost um, in their garden beds in particular. And I've heard people say, you know, those with really clay soil, that if you put compost in every year, eventually it really turns around. Um, but you've got to kind of work for it. And I think the fertilizer is like a little injection. It does not um, address the soil quality overall. So that's my long-winded response to that question. <laughs> yeah. That was amazing. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, next question is from Carl. Um, and they said that they planted scrubs on their front lawn and now the runner grass with long tap roots that spread has taken over. And they're wanting to know what's the best way to get rid of the grass. The best way to get rid of grass mm -hmm. in, exactly. in the garden beds? Mm -hmm. Is that right? So it, it seems, I'll, I'll repeat the question. I planted yeah. scrubs on my front lawn and now the runner grass that has the tap roots that spread has taken over and they're wanting to get rid of that runner grass. Yeah, is that like Bermuda grass or something like that? Possibly. Uh, Carl, I'm, I'm not sure if you're still on and wanna, yeah, you can go ahead and unmute. Oh, you're still muted, Carl. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it should have said shrubs, not yeah. scrubs. I have I some figured. blueberries and some other shrubs and the grass, it has tap roots. And I don't know if that's Bermuda grass, but they're like a foot long and they just grow into everything and take over. And yeah. I'm not sure if I have to dig pull the, the shrubs out and replant everything, or I just don't know how to get rid of the grass in a safe way. I don't want to put, you know, put poison on it. Uh-huh. So I don't know exactly what kind of grass you're talking about, but if you, this kind of goes back to creating a barrier around um, your shrubs in this case. So, so it's the opposite of uh, like what I was saying before about keeping, containing uh, things like uh, the runner bamboo or whatever, or the knotweed, it's like trying to keep things out. So you yeah. may dig down and put some kind of essentially a trench there. Um, maybe put stones, maybe put some kind of, um, you know, edging there, metal edging, or even cobblestones or something like that, bricks, anything to try to create a barrier that makes your life less of a hassle with that stuff. Um, if you have it already around your shrubs and already right there, then you may need to, I don't know if digging out the whole shrub is necessary, but I don't have a sense of the scale of the problem here. Yeah, know? some of them it's grown into the root system now. And I have to, I have taken things out and had to pull the grass out of the, the roots of the plant. Okay. It's, yeah, and the tap roots can get a foot long on this grass. Oh, wow. I don't know what wow. it is, but it's this, it's horrible. Wow. <laughs> so, I, okay. I can jump in. Uh, yes. It, it sounds like wire grass. I have some of that growing in my yard and the roots go fairly uh, uh, deep into the ground, maybe like six inches or more. I usually dig them out with yeah. a, like a weeder and I pull all this wire grass out. It does spread a lot and it yeah. has these long root like things that keep right. spreading. It's like bamboo in a way because it gr grows along this almost yeah. just below the surface. And and I have quite a bit of that, but I I you know I diligently uh. get them out. That okay. sounds horrible. With, uh, I guess that answers yeah. the question that you might have to dig dig those shrubs out, then create yeah. a yeah. 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 
Um, Thank you. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, just a few more questions here. Uh, Jay wants to know, um, so they have four beautiful hostess right next to their house and they want to know what's the best way to split them and move them further away under the tree. Yes, I love I love uh, dividing hostas. So um, there's a couple of different ways that I've found to be useful. If they're very well established, um, it's going to be hard to dig that whole thing out, in which case what I've found to be um, successful is to pry off pieces. So you take your shovel and you go in at an angle and you just try to, and then you push your shovel down and pry off a piece and you don't get precious about it because those things are really hard to kill actually once they're established. I've heard people say that they, you know, dug up pieces of hosta and just dump them in a wheelbarrow or off to the corner for a while for months. And then they're just alive and fine. So that's one way is to pry off pieces um, off really established, huge, um, you know, plants with big roots. The other way, if it's a younger plant, is to dig up the whole thing, lay it on its side, and then just drive your shovel right through it. It's totally fine. So you can have a, a hosta that's, you know, let, I'm just going to make this up, three years old or whatever. You put it on its side, you dig it up, you could probably make five plants out of that thing, maybe even 10 um, if you think about the size of the plants that you can buy in the garden centers, some of them are very small. And then of course they cost, you know, $9.99 or whatever. So think about how many plants you could get from one big hosta. The other thing you can do is if it's situated in the ground and it looks like you can do it, stick your shovel right in there while it's even still in the ground. Um, again, you can do this anytime. In the fall, it's a good time because you don't need to care what it looks like. Um, after you do it. So you can just totally mangle it and it'll be fine. Great, thanks. And uh, Jay is thanking you for your feedback in the in the chat there. Um, yeah. Our last question is from Cecilia and they're asking, is it necessary to always apply a protective sealer to cut branches? Oh, thank you so much for that question. No, it is not. I'm not an arborist, so let me just say that. But my understanding of that is that was that's very old school. I think that people used to think that you needed to paint, um, you know, uh, on the tree where the branches once were. The tree heals on its own um, or, or shrubs. They heal on their own. Try not to leave stubs when you prune, but also don't cut too close in on the tree, like on the collar where it kind of protrudes out a little bit. You want to find that balance. You want a clean cut with sharp tools um, and then uh, you should be good to go. Great. Uh, that's all the questions we have. Awesome. Great. Well, it was such a pleasure being with you all. Oh, I see one more. I see. I see. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very quick question. Uh, yeah. There's a ground cover called periwinkle. Yeah. Um, does it like sun or does it like shade? It seems to be very finicky about uh, the amount of light it gets. Oh, so. that's interesting. So I have a lot of that actually, and yeah. it likes both for me, for me. Mm. These things, this is a perfect example of though, that something can be, you know, very happy in one climate or region and very unhappy in another. It's also mm. a perfect example of something that can be very aggressive in some people's yards or regions and very hard to spread in others. And right. so for me, I'm trying actively to spread it around in my yard. And then I hear from other people, it's so aggressive, they can't get rid of it. But in my experience, it's very happy in full sun and, and shade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yes. You so it was very informative. Thanks oh, so good. Much. I'm glad. Yeah, Thank you so it. much, everyone, for, for hanging in there, all your questions, your enthusiasm. Happy gardening to everyone. And I hope uh, hope you have a nice winter of dormancy. You too. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Jess. Bye-bye. Uh, thank, thank you so much. And thank you all so much. This was fantastic. Bye. I hope you all have found today's session insightful. Be sure to mark your, your calendars uh, for October 25th 
at 4 30 p.m eastern as we will be offering our new gardening tech at a glance lecture and i'm actually going to put that link in the chat here to the event page um so that you guys can uh check it out uh we also wanted to share some interesting insights that we received from our recent gardening tech survey we asked participants about their gardening interests and, and challenges, and it's clear that many of you are very passionate about gardening and have a keen interest in gardening technology, particularly app and irrigation systems. We saw that most people who have used tech and gardening have found value in plant and pest identification apps. Additionally, we discovered that the preferred learning method is watching recorded demos and introductory lectures. So, Take a look at our uh, our calendar on our website, uh, upcoming online classes, and, and look to see what's coming up in, in the world of gardening. Some of the challenges you shared include patio gardening, automating tasks like watering and, and monitoring soil quality, receiving reminders for fertilizing, managing weeds and bugs, and maximizing space in your garden designs, among other challenges. As we co continue to collect feedback on this topic, we encourage you to participate in our gardening gadget tech survey. And I dropped that link in the chat earlier, but I'll put it in in a sec again. And, and it's to help us better understand your preferences and challenges in the world of gardening. Your input is extremely invaluable and it helps us to shape future sessions and resources. So take our gardening tech survey here, putting the link right in the chat. And I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at the upcoming Gardening Tech Lecture on October 25th. Happy gardening, everyone.